This podcast is a member of the Blueberry Network. Blueberry. That's Blueberry, B-L-U-B-R-R-Y dot com. Blueberry, with no E's. Remember, you drop the E's. Welcome to Books Boys, live from the Grand Library, the Dean and PJ. He's PJ. Hello there. I'm the Dean, and we are the Books Boys. The Books Boys, the one and only. This is the Books Boys show. Get it? Oh, Buy yeah. it. Books. Books. Dean, what are books? I, I think well, I explained it last time, but I, I, I've been having some difficulty going to the supermarket, and they are just saying, like, it's paper and pens, and they just but I, they just give you toilet paper and stuff. What, what, what are books exactly? We had some confusion about this, Pete. Yeah. And I tried to explain to everyone what books were. And we yeah. have had, we've only done one episode. We've had hundreds of uh, listener complaints, PJ. Hundreds yeah, of just, more people they, complained than even heard the show. Well, they just, they just don't know what it is, Dean. You know, they thought they, it was they, something on the Twitters. Well, they thought it was something, yeah. They, 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 they thought it was something for the old PlayStation, PlayStation X or no, or whatever it is, right? Yeah, yeah, they didn't. They didn't know. They didn't know. Yeah. And yeah. Um, maybe it's an app, or I, I don't know. Maybe it's in the clouds. But okay. People yeah. didn't know what the books were, so I, we, we can start. But I thought, look, I'd rather. I'm going to give you two choices. Either we can okay. talk about the books we've been reading, um, okay, you know, and that's nice. Or maybe we can inform people by doing a historical books podcast where we talk about the invention of the printing press, you know, how to make their own papyrus, uh, that kind of thing. Which oh. do you think would be more entertaining to the listeners? Well, uh, it's hard to tell, but let's go with the books that we've read and then maybe okay. we can more or less in- intuitively stand what a book actually is. Fair enough. Well, uh, we do have some news. We put out one episode and right. so far we are the highest rated Books Boys podcast. So no. of all the podcasts that are called Books Boys, we are sure. the highest rated. Um, but we do have a close rival. The literature lads are hot on our tails. So are just, the literature uh, lads are at it again. I've they're t- at it again. I've told, I've told them to take it easy, you know, that they don't want to be they don't want to get too competitive with us. Those literary lads, yeah. Who That's they it. Do? They're at it. But you know, we're gonna put out some good content and we're gonna we're gonna do it. So PJ, what have you been reading this month? Um, I've been reading this month Don Quixote de la Mancha, the classic Spanish novel from um, Miguel de Cervantes. So, as you know, it's been written between 1605 and 1615, published between those 10 years. And it's basically considered um, one of the most important novels in the world. Some think it's the most important novel in the world. And some think it's the first proper modern novel in the world. So there's been novels before, but... It's, been, it's a proper modern novel, uh, first one. So, um, yeah, uh, what can I say about it? Um, I'm really enjoying it. I haven't finished it yet. But what I like about Don Quixote is basically it's about a, it's about a man. You know, he's not, he's not the youngest sprout. And he regrets this. You know, he didn't marry. He's kind of living with his niece for some reason, unexplained why he's living with the old niece and a housemate, I think. And he's just spending all his days reading as proper lads do, novels. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so he'd be the kind of man who'd really appreciate books, boys, and would have maybe a good answer to what a book is. Um, but it's very funny because the way he's described is he doesn't really read great literature. He kind of reads trash literature is what I'm, I'm, what's implied that. Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah. The equivalent, basically, in the 17th century. Yeah, Fifty Shades of Armour, more than likely, yes. And basically, it's just like, they're just and romances about knights, like saving damsels in distress and like, you know, killing dragons and all kinds of nonsense. And he gets very inspired by this. It becomes his life. And then one day he just decides, actually, you know what? I am also going to make this kind of story, this, this basically this um, knight saving damsel story into reality. And he just gets out some old armor from his ancestors, just puts it on. It's all rusty and, and, and crap. And he just goes on on his horse and just rides the rides the land of Spain. So um, that's basically the premise. 
And um, when when was this book from? Oh, a time period. So it isn't a historical, well, it wasn't a historical novel at that time. So that's the whole irony of it. The, the story, so it's, it's, the, it's obviously the late 16th century, early 17th century. So it's modern, but basically the, the guy, Don Quixote, is not living in the present. He's living in medieval Spain, and that's long and gone and finished and outmoded. But he doesn't want to let go of that reality. He just wants to live in that fictional world of medieval Spain. It's a tragic comedy, basically. It's, advice. it's basically because everyone around him knows he's a madman. And everyone around him just thinks he's crazy, except his one and true friend, Sancho Panza. Because basically, that's the only one who believes in him. And he kind of goes around uh, helping Don Quixote in his missions, thinking that someday he might become a prince. And the whole irony is, of course, that he would never become a prince. And Don Quixote would never be a, a knight, per se. But with the power, this is what I love about the book, with the power of our imagination, they believe that what happens to them, they interpret as, as, as reality. So they think, like, they, at the beginning, they attack these windmills. So Don Quixote attacks these windmills thinking that they're giants. And he believes them, and, like, he believes the story. He actually believes that he's living the, the life of knights and princesses and, and giants and dragons. And... But at the same time, it's always done in a comedic and sad way. There's some, there's some kind of theme of mental illness like going on, I feel like, in the background. It's, that's what makes it so modern. It's not anymore just an adventure story. It's, it's a story about how literature can, for the good and for the bad, take your life uh, and out of control. And it's, you can see it as really pessimistic or you can see it as really enlightening that out of his boring life, out of his twilight he years, he manages to become a, a prince and knight in his own little world. So that's what Don Quixote is for, for me. I, and I think it's brilliant. And it's, as far as I know, sir, it's the uh, best-selling book of all time, right? I, I, I read that somewhere as well. Like, I read somewhere, I think in Spain, it's the best-selling novel, book, after the Bible. Yeah. So, yeah. so there apart, from, apart from the Bible, it is, I believe, worldwide the best-selling book of all time. Best-selling and, novel, sort of fictional novel anyway. Exactly, yeah. And yeah, and basically, as I just said, there were novels before that, but there was never this um, profoundness of, of like modern themes. I mean, modern in a sense of like loss and identity crisis and stuff that they didn't talk in little adventure novels, like old men becoming sad and trying to save their, their years, trying to regain them, and damsels that are not, not necessarily beautiful, but they might be a bit ugly, but they still want love and a, and the horses are not so elegant, and and there are obese man and sick man, and it's all very, it's it's a, for the first time it's reality basically. And this is essentially the archetype for that pittoresque adventure novel, the kind of thing that Dickens copied in the Pickwick Papers, for example, that classic story. Exactly, and you know more about that because you're you're the big fan of Dumas, for example, and the Three Musketeers, and in some sense I think it also influences. Um, uh, future adventure books that are more like all the adventure come afterwards that are not just about adventures but it's more like the inner traveling of a man mm -hmm. so I feel like that's what that's what Don Quixote managed uh, to do and uh, and Cervantes I also want to add actually that Cervantes was a bit of a he, he lacked confidence like I'm reading a bit about his life and I find it interesting that he seemed to lack confidence in his writing is the impression I get even though some might disagree because he was, uh, he's basically, he was friends with Lope de Vega, so they basically the another classic. He was considered at the time a better writer, and he, and this guy Lope de Vega actually said that Don Quixote was trash, and it was, must have been very per painful because like he obviously must have invested so much time, like I said, ten years of publishing, over seven hundred pages, and just it was just called trash by his once one of his one one of his once best friends. And I think it must have been a hard journey to write this novel and to have the confidence that someday this will be appreciated because it was mm -hmm. so different for at the time. No, this novel is very long, yeah. It, it's very long, yeah. It's, it, it's, on, it's on par with, uh, you know, The Agriculture Manual by Lev Tolstoy, mm -hmm. also known as Anna Karenina. I'm not sure if you read it. It's... Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember Anna Karenina. I do remember uh, 700 pages of agriculture, though. Maybe well, there was a story in the side about a girl. I, I don't remember. Was, it's kind of more like the side stories that Liev Tolstoy wrote when he was feeling bored. Was that agriculture? He just wrote a little love story. 
and then just incorporate yeah. it to the book. I guess you know every every farming manual needs a love story. It's like in Hollywood, they got a shoehorn love story in everywhere. You know. Well, that's right, then. That's right. But anyway, that's all I want to say about Don Quixote. I don't even want to talk about the story that much, but partially just because I'm still very much the beginning, to be honest. But it's already like um, there's already something tragic comedy about something like it did make me laugh out loud. It's kind of unusual, I find, with old novels, just because I feel like the humor gets lost in translation. But like, just like I don't know, like Aristophanes, for example, like the real classic comedy or Shakespeare comedy is funny, and this is funny while also being really sad. Actually, if mm-hmm. you just look behind that comedy, so that's what I'm oh, saying. I really recommend uh, it. By the way, I have a feedback. Uh, one of the books that you mentioned last time, um, yeah, Hundred Years of Solitude. Turns out that is my girlfriend's favorite book. So is it? I'm delighted. I yeah. Found out afterwards, when she listened to the show, yeah. Well, well, you know, uh, it is basically a, a novel about Latin America and and so much more than that. But I feel like. I, I can just, I have never been to Latin America, but it's just, I really recommend you read it so you can get that sense of history of how a Latin American village started or like the, or like the prototype, Macondo, mm-hmm. and how it evolved and how it was abused and how it died and how it also like faded out of memory and in and out. So yeah, I'm glad she, I'm glad she mentioned it. I'm glad she likes the book. It's a sweet novel. Well, well, what have I been reading this month? Uh, quite a lot. I've been a, a busy beaver this month. I've read right, three complete have. novels. Um, the first is Candide and Other Works by Voltaire. Mm. Now, okay. technically, I suppose you could say this one's not a novel. It's essentially four short stories or four novellas. Okay. Um, Voltaire, of course, didn't really write novels. He did some essays, some philosophy, some short stories. Mm. Um what we effectively have here is four stories, Zadig, Candide, The Ingenu, and Nanin. I'm not going to go into them all in detail, but Candide is the, the famous one. Mm-hmm. And it's also called Optimism. It, mm-hmm. it, it's the best. It's essentially a short work. It's only about 70 pages each. And it's just um, this character, Candide, going around being incredibly optimistic in the face of any hardship that he comes across. And he was told by his you know, local village philosophy teacher... You know, always to keep this positive outlook, and they get into worse and worse scrapes while he continues to just, you know, but I, it's all for the good because that's what I was taught. But he doesn't okay. question that until near the end. He just sticks with, I was told everything works out for the best, and, and that's it. Okay, okay, interesting. And it's based on uh, the, the German philosopher, uh, well, not. <laughs> Uh, at least the place where Germany would become Germany it wasn't Germany at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leibniz, right? The it's based on Leibniz, Leibnizian optimism. Yes. Like optimistic philosophy. Can you tell us more about that exactly? Because I don't know that much about Leibniz uh, philosophy, to be honest. Uh, the only stuff I remember from being Leibniz in university was the famous Leibniz's law. So that mm. was the. Um, identically equals that's where we get that the triple equals line like is identically right. equal to so that's this idea that uh, you only persist in your personal identity over a period of time if you're identically equal and therefore you have every trait so okay for example me 10 years ago i'm not exactly the same as i am now therefore you know we, we cannot necessarily prove identity we're not All right, yeah. equal um but i'm not so familiar with his stuff on optimism but as far as I know, um, that's an interesting thought, but as far as I know, he, he did believe that this world, ex- so he, he tried to prove the existence of God by saying that, um, the existence of evil and God, by saying that, yes, this might be a not so good world as you may think, but actually, practically, this is the best of all possible worlds. That was his idea, I think. Of and course, he, he practiced, yes, he the possible that, right? worlds theory, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's something that still holds true today because people say, oh, but why? evil in the world and why is it this and that and you say yeah but you know other po- the other possibilities might have been worse yeah like, yeah and, this could and be realistically the best that we can get if because it doesn't exist you know and free will and all so that's the whole kind of free will versus uh, determinism yeah. basically it's better to have the free will and the person decides to do something even though it might become evil yeah exactly yeah. and once you factor that in you know maybe we are the best of all possible worlds 
But I don't know if I'm buying that. Yeah, no, I, I don't really buy that either. And Voltaire definitely is kind of tying Leibniz to, you know, F off, basically. Yeah. Is There's it, one thing, of course, that I do buy. The reason this is the best of all possible worlds is because it exists. So that's, yeah, okay. that's a critique. Like, if existence is part of perfection, then we are the best simply because we do exist, you know. Right, okay, okay. That could but, be actually fine. I'm not going to focus too much on Voltaire because it was my, okay. my least favorite of the three books I read. Candide right. was good, but the rest wasn't really... Zadig okay. was very boring. The so, Ingenue was quite funny because they basically take someone from abroad, you know, what they consider a kind of savage, and they try oh. to educate him into, um, you know, English religion or, right. or Western sort of religion. But of course, he's reading the Bible and he's saying, well, the things you're telling me to do, these aren't in your Bible. And, you know, so he, go, he wants to get baptized in a lake like Jesus and they want to do it, you know, in a church and all this oh, kind of stuff. So it's basically just like the ultimate social critique, basically. Like the whole it's, a, it's a critique general. on religion, but in a very humorous way. Uh, and religion, okay, cool. The and second what... book I read um, was I finally finished my roundup of the Brontes, and uh, I read Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Cool. Now, yeah. I have to make an addendum on what I said last week. I said mm. that I wasn't sure Charlotte was the best. I really liked Anne's writings. And while that's still true... Having read Villette, I think this book is the best of all the Bronte books. Oh, Lord. Well, um, yeah, why? I... Obviously, that Charlotte wrote Jane Eyre. I think that yeah. that bumps her back up on top. Okay. And Villette, I know nothing about Villette. So what makes it so special? And like, well, briefly. So basically, it's your, it's a, it's a young girl. I don't want to give too many spoilers, but to yep. kind of cover the early parts of the novel, she goes to work in a little school in, uh, in Paris. Mm-hmm. And she takes on a job there as a as a teacher of English, mm-hmm. and obviously she gets you know relationships with other people. I mentioned in the last episode that certain elements of this are taken from her unpublished work, The Professor. And of oh. course, there is a professor in the book, and her relationship with him. It's kind of it's kind of poorly written in one sense, which is about a third of the way through the book, they start mm. calling him the professor, and they didn't call him that at the beginning. So I think she's. <laughs> Just shoehorning in as her other novel, you know. Yeah, but yeah. to be honest, I, I let her off with that because it's a really, really, really enjoyable story. There is, okay. yes, there's some love stories, but it's just, it's this romantic kind of Paris that she's in. And she's just, you know, teaching. The Brontes love their kind of governess tales, you know, mm. um, about young girls trying to, you know, teach in private houses. But it was nice to see it done in an actual school setting. And you, you get to see her relationship with the other um, pupils there as well. And mm. um, she's quite shy, so she's afraid of maybe even some of the other teachers. But it, it all has a nice ending. It's very, very good. Um, I would really, really recommend anyone who's interested in the Brontes, maybe they've read Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights or something like that, and they thought, you know, that's all there is. This is the one to read. I think it is the best one. And as a result of that, I'm going to officially crown Charlotte the Queen of the Bronte. Okay, congratulations, Charlotte. Well, so you're not giving even Emily Bronte. You're not really saying much about Emily Bronte. So, um, it is the romance in Villette very different to the Woodring Heights romance, which is very kind of tragic and dark. And is it a different kind of romance? In Villette. It's it's different, but not as much as you might think. So yes, it's not the horrible romance that you get in yeah. Wuthering Heights, where they, they they hate each other. Actually, it's yeah. not that. But she doesn't right. like him. She doesn't like the professor. Oh, okay. And so it's still at the beginning, similar. she thinks he's you know he's an unpleasant sort of character. She doesn't find him attractive. She hates his personality and his looks and everything. But she you know basically through becoming accustomed to someone you, you you fall in love with them and that's that's yeah. kind of how the brontes seem to view love in a, in a lot of their works right it's okay. never it's never really a love at first sight hollywood moment you know mm. it's it's through through knowing someone you get to see past their flaws and you get okay. to love the the person underneath and discover their gentler side and it's a touching story and uh, i flew through it it was just a lovely lovely enjoyable read but right. um, i do have one quote which I would like to read, just because it shows me um, just the kind of the kind of book it is. So <laughs> let me see if I can grab my quote here. There is, despite being written by you know uh, a girl by a lady, uh-huh. there uh-huh. is um, some old world you know sexism in it in, in the characters. 
Okay. So we have this. The professor is referring to women of intellect, which are, you know, his uh, enemy in a sense. In, in quotes, women of intellect was his next theme. Here, he was at home. A, uh, quote, woman of intellect, it appeared, was a sort of luscious, luscious nature, a luckless accident, a thing for which there was neither place nor use in creation, wanted neither as wife nor worker. Beauty anticipated her in the first office. He believed in his soul that lovely, placid, and passive feminine mediocrity was the only pillow on which manly thought and sense could find rest for its aching temples. And as to work, male mind alone could work to any good practical result. So it's interesting to put, you know, uh, this is the person that a female author has her mm. heroine fall in love with. <laughs> mm. it's strange, isn't it? Um, I, the only thing I think of is that at least it's not like it sounds like that um, Charlotte Brown is not necessarily. Yeah, she's not saying she portraying him as ugly and brute and the same with Heathcliff he's also ugly and brute but maybe they want to say that even in these flawed broken up man they can see something beautiful and maybe the reader can see something beautiful in the professor after a while I'm not sure but um, it seems like to me not that Charlotte Brown is like unaware of sexism but the opposite like very aware and making the professor and purpose like this the same like Heathcliff and Audrey Heights by Emily Bronte, right? Oh yes, I mean, and of yeah, course yeah. we do just we do discover a better side to the professor as as the novel goes on. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, the novel it, also features a girl who is the ultimate coquette. You know, she's going to inherit money from her rich uncle or something like that. So she just goes around and she, you know, borrowing money from people, and she just wants fancy dresses and she wants all the men to fall in love with her that she can deliberately cast them aside afterwards and she kind of values her own worth as you know how many hearts can i break and there's a very very quick two-line quote here where she's but if he loves you as much as you say and yet it comes to nothing in the end he will be made miserable of course he will break his heart i should be shocked and disappointed if he didn't like you know her she just wants him to hurt because, for, for no reason through, through okay. no maliciousness but just because and um, that's how she kind of sees her own value as a, as a pretty girl. Right, okay, yeah. So, yeah, it seems like Charlotte Bronte had a lot, has a deep understanding also, like, also how flawed this girl is, and so how flawed men of the time were, how flawed women of the time were. And it's something that sometimes lacks, maybe, with male authors, even the classics. I sometimes don't get a deeper psychological portrait of, of characters, and how f sometimes characters are so two-dimensional, you know, especially especially even in older literature, it's more of a, for me, it is more of a modern thing, like maybe 200 years ago onwards, that people are focusing more on the psychological aspects. So it sounds like, I would like to read Villette, so it, sounds, it does sound very good. Right, yeah, and what's, you, what's the other book? You, the other book is, um, well, I was just going to say quickly, if you want to read any Bronte, this is actually the one I would recommend above any of the famous ones. But okay. the last book, now I got swindled on this one. It's called The Vicomte de Bragelonne. Okay. Uh, this is a Dumas book. It is the oh. third in the Three Musketeers series. Okay. And the reason I got swindled is because, you know, I had the first book. I read it. It's brilliant. Then I couldn't find the second one for a long time. So I had this third one sitting on my shelf for months. And I went to um, one of our favorite uh, places, oh. the Magic Bookshop. And I got on the ground and I crawled around for about two hours <laughs> with a hundred books all around me. Uh, they, you know, these, they, we're talking books two or three meters high in stack, oh, it's, four it's, deep. It, there is a reason why we call it. There, I was just saying, there's to the listeners, there's a reason why we call it the magic bookshop. It's literally, uh, it's literally uh, the the one, the owner of the shop is a magician. So he actually is a magician, and he owns this bookshop that's just covered in bloody books everywhere, and it's a delight. But you really have to get like an excavation um, team sometimes to excavate <laughs> three, four rows of books everywhere, and you can hardly move. And it's wonderful. I was in a little dark corner with no lighting, using the torch on my phone. You know, I must have had about 400 books all around the floor. And eventually I find the second one in the series and I read it and it was good. And then I thought, brilliant. Now I can finally get to this third one after the anticipation. You know. So this yeah. is the third and final book in the, no in the trilogy. Or yeah. is it? Turns out the third book was so bloody long, they had to release it in three volumes. So all I've got volume one. <laughs> right, okay. Oh my god. So you still what you still so you have to look for volume two now of this. I need two book. more and volumes. Three? Yeah. Oh nightmare. my god. But 
what this book, I mean, it's it's poorly titled. It's not about the Vicomte de Braglione at all. I mean, maybe in the second and third parts it is. But in the part I've read, he's basically a minor character. And then, you know, maybe in the last hundred pages, he starts to become more major. Okay. Um, but essentially, what this is about is D'Artagnan, who's the, the hero of the whole, you know, Three Musketeers series. Yeah. And... Um, it's about him. It's not so much about the other musketeers. Um, so just to give you a quick breakdown of the of the, the three musketeers, you've got Athos, who's a little bit older than the others. He's very respected. He's the fatherly figure to D'Artagnan. Uh, he doesn't really speak all that much, but he can handle his food. He can handle his booze. He's wise. And when he says, you know, this is what we're going to do, they listen. He's very right. respected. Then you've got Porthos, who's a big, muscly brute of a guy. But he's not just, he's not the most intelligent, but he's not your silly brute either. He's aristocratic and he loves his fancy clothes and he has so many different titles after all the different estates that he owns. As you would, yeah, sure. And then you've got Aramis, who doesn't really want to be a musketeer. He wants to be a priest. Um, but he's also, you know, very lucky with the ladies and he has to hide oh. that because it's not really what he should be doing as a, as oh. a priest, you know. But he's... Um, constantly having affairs with you know aristocrats wives and things so All right quite quite a quite a group actually yeah. yeah now in this novel porthos and aramis appear once for maybe you know one or two chapters and then they disappear they haven't had a big stance in this novel but we do see a lot of athos and of course um the the principal character d'artagnan himself okay. it's not nice to see them not working together i wanted to see the three you know D'Artagnan and the Three Musketeers, one for all and all for one. You don't get as much of that in this novel. Um, mm. It's essentially, the first 300 pages could be a standalone book. Okay. And then it just kind of goes on and on and it gets a bit strange. Um, right, we, we so it loses the plot. Yeah, I mean, there's a beautiful little plot that just finishes nicely. Um it's essentially about Charles II trying to retake his throne. These are all okay. set in history, so in the previous book, we see the death of Charles I, and now we see Charles II trying to retake his throne, and he goes to Paris, to the Louvre, to speak to um, the king there. Um, but the king there is, you know, 20 years old, he's young, he's not experienced, and he has no power, because all the power is concentrated in the hands of the cardinal. Uh, and the cardinal keeps telling him, well, you can't do anything, you're poor, you've got no money, you can't help him, you can't even help yourself. But secretly, the cardinal's got like, you know, 60 million uh, livres put away. Of course he does, yeah. That's... And there's a nice quote here from the cardinal pretending how poor they are. Okay. Um, and I'll just read this. It's very good. They say, and what exactly, sorry, and that is exactly what I am not willing to do, my dear sire. If England were to act exactly according to my wishes, she could not act better than she does. If I directed the policy of England from this place, I should not direct it otherwise. Governed as she is governed, England is an infernal nest of contention for all of Europe, and that hasn't changed even today. Holland protects Charles II, let Holland do so. They will quarrel, they will fight. They are the only two maritime powers. Let them destroy each other's navies. We can construct ours with the wrecks of their vessels if we ever have enough money to buy nails. But actually, yeah, 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 60 million put away. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's crazy. But he's always maintaining this illusion that they're poor, you know? If we've got the nails, yeah, okay. Because he it. wants the money for himself, even on his deathbed. He's like, no, but it's it's my money. The king's not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jesus, um, so okay. there's a nice there's a nice story about that. And that, you know, that takes 300 pages, and that's lovely. And then we have um, the Viscount himself, whose name is Raoul. And he basically fancies a girl and wants to marry her. And that's okay. pretty much his entire involvement in this novel. Um, okay. The main character really is always D'Artagnan. And it's just his adventures and um, getting involved with kings and queens in France and in England. Um, but I'm really looking forward to reading the next the next part because it just stops. There's no there's no end. You know, ah, it just no. stops suddenly. And now you have to wait for years probably to find it or something. That's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> I think I might have to give up and buy it online. I think I can't. You might. When you want something very specific, it's hard to rely on the magic bookshop sometimes. You know? Sometimes the magic bookshop only gives you the magic when. When it's unasked for, you know what I mean? It's just you can't just go there expecting it to just fulfill your you wishes. Can, you can walk in and leave an hour later with thirty books. But if yeah. you go in looking for one very specific book, you might never find it. You might never find it. Yeah, it's not destined quite now. I mean, I mean, to be honest, though, people always say that oh, you, you know, so the books are out, 
So I imagine you've got a series of like six or five books and you need to read them all at once. But if you just want to actually, but if you want to be like genuine historically, you might as well just wait the amount of years it's taken the original author to publish the novels and just have the original experience. You know, it's, it's, it's probably t- how long did it take? Like 10 years or something like that to write those? Yeah, they were all written novel? a good few years apart. So I think so you're right. That's a more, a more genuine experience. You know? Yeah, it's just everyone's become so greedy. I mean, what's the greed for? Because you can also look forward to it. Yeah. Um, there's one thing I want to I want to just step back a little because I neglected yeah. to say one thing about Villette, um, right. and that is that the only criticism I had of the novel because I made it sound really good, but I do have one criticism. Yeah, it is full, especially in the second half of religion, and there's a lot okay. of Protestant versus Catholic stuff. And being from Northern <laughs> Ireland, I'm just sick of that, and I don't want that in my novel. Um, yeah, it's sad that they put that in there. They can't um, help uh, forcing kind of ideology. I, I mean, I, I understand, you know, it's it was a prevalent issue at the time. And obviously the Bronte homeland's like 20 minutes from here. So there are ties and everything. But I, I just don't know. I don't know why we need yeah, that. I get it. And the, the second side of the criticism is that Charlotte likes to show off that she knew French. And um, so a lot of the time there's just, you know, entire paragraphs in French for no reason. But um, you know that you know that Tolstoy did that as well, especially with War and Peace more than Anna Karenina. So basically, it's a little it's, bit uh, in Anna Karenina, yeah. But, but and War and Peace, I believe even more because it's um, basically Russians reading those those, those novels back in the um, so whatever 1860s. So, um, basically, the idea is that first of all, Tolstoy tried to make realistic. So the so the Russians, the Russian aristocrats, actually did write letters to each other in French. And talk to each other in French sometimes, but also like, you know, you can't read this novel unless you're kind. There's something snobbish about it. You can't read War and Peace unless you're a bit more than just a Russian kind of farmer. Yeah. It's very you, ironic. It makes yeah. sense in the case of Anna Karenina because it's important that the French know how to correctly manage their farms as well. Well, it's very important, I believe. Uh, you made an act. You made a very good point. So now the French can do it. Yeah. Hmm. So but you know what? Job. What I will say in in Charlotte's defense. When yeah. I read Emily's Wuthering Heights, they have something even less understandable to me than the French. Because I could, you know, I could sort of understand <laughs> a bit of what was going on in the French. Yeah, they yeah. have um, rural English. Right, so, yeah. So the, Wuthering the Heights is a lot of Yorkshire, you know, y- people speaking in, in some kind of farmer country tongue. And I couldn't understand a word of it. So I actually prefer the French. Okay, fair enough. So you, can look, you can see it now as a positive thing. But That's good. what we're going to do next, sir, is we'll do our recommendation for the month. Um, but before right. we do that, we do need to have a word from our sponsors. Indeed our corporate do. sponsor this month is Hungry Hungry Hypocrites. Do you remember this game, sir? It's I, a little it's a little I, game with hippos. You can get versions with frogs, you know, I, off-brand I, I versions. I do did, you but, eat the little, little pellets. But there was something fake about them, wasn't there? So, I mean, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so... Well, yeah. this is Hungry Hungry Hypocrites, right. and instead of hippos or frogs or whatever version you had, yeah. it's some of the world's leading hypocrites. Uh, so Off. Trump's in there, for example. You know, Off. people, um, they're going to eat the pellets and show you how to be capitalist and, and take all the wealth for themselves. Right, okay. So Hungry Hungry Hypocrites, you can actually order that. It's orders at hungry, hungryhypocrites.gov. And if you do all it right. right now, it's on a special buy none, get none offer. You don't buy what? it, you don't get it. All right, okay. Well, I've got to click on it right now, right? Get it. Jesus. Let's do it. Yeah. That's a great offer. That's but a PJ, great offer. Yeah. In addition to our corporate sponsors, what? We, got we are yeah. always supported by the listener. Now, we don't have the Patreons or the PayPals, but what you can do to support the show is just take a check and write on there where you've got your dollar sign or your pound sign or your euro. You just put life savings in the amount. <laughs> And you just post that to um, Books Boys at the Grand Library P.O. Box Books and just send that directly to us In and you can world, help yeah. to support the show. And oh, yeah. as, a, as a massive thank you, PJ, what do they get? They get access to our bonus content, the Bufanda Boys. Bufanda Boys, that's right. No one can get that unless they give us our, you know, a life saving send or something very precious. Bufanda Boys is going to be the new monthly show exclusive for it's our donors. It's a word-for-word, second-by-second remake of this show, but we both wear very pretty scarves during the recording process. 
and it's something else, guys. So I mean, now, I, we should tell the, we shouldn't let anyone know that you're wearing a scarf actually now because I, then I am. the donors are getting uh, swindled. Yeah, I know, but no one can see it. So it's only like basically, basically, guys. Whoever can only Dean can see me right now, so it's a very confidential sort of thing. So if you want to have that extra confidence, like if you, if you want to feel like the books boys are your best mates, then just get to show so you can see us wearing scarves and feel the extra bit of confidence. We do have and, one listener actually with us live in the in the video recording. It's Apollo. He's just a little statuette of Apollo just watching the show live. Privileged. Well, as as he would, I would hope. I'm glad he's there today because he wasn't there last time, the cheeky bollocks. You know what I mean? He wasn't, but now he's here and uh, he's not going to come on the show, but he did tell me uh, what he'd been reading this month was, of course, the Citadels, uh, History of the Peloponnesian War. That's what Apollo has been reading this month. Has he now? Because last time I caught him... Last time I caught him reading Stephen King in the bathroom, so I don't think you know what I mean. I think he's a bit of a chancer. I think he likes ah. to pretend he's all intellectual and all that stuff. Mm, that lets reading, me down. That's disappointing. I saw him reading Misery the other day. Yeah, she gave him. Yeah, kind of between, between like a big pamphlet of like old writing. I was kind of just reading Misery. Mm. Yeah, she gave him. Yeah. One more thing. Did you know that the listeners can email booksboys at hotmail dot com, and what they can do is. In just one, you know, to one or two sentences, tell us what they're reading this month, and I yeah. will pick one at random, and I will send them in the mail a free mystery book from my bounteous bookshelves, the Estanteria of Doom. That is very generous, Dean. That's very generous. Yeah, I think that's a lovely thing. random book. If you ever thought to yourself, can I give my address, my postal address, to a stranger and have him post me a book that I will not like, you can now do that. Get it okay. here. Email well, at you're... hotmail.com. You are fulfilling someone's dreams. So, I mean, Someone's. great job. But mostly, I'm just curious to know what the listeners are reading and to get their recommendation. Yeah. So, tell us, guys, what are you reading apart from catalogs and TV guides? What are you reading? Get out get out the old book. You more or less know what it is by now. Just get out any old book and tell us if you liked it. Tell us if you hated it. Tell us any thoughts you have about that odd little format called book where worlds and universes are contained and kept alive. Now, do you know when I was in Egypt, I went to a papyrus making workshop to see how they made papyrus. Oh, but what I don't that. know, what I don't know is the more modern things. I don't know how we bind our books. I don't know how we print them in the yeah. printing press. So yeah. I need to do my research, PJ. Yeah, no, actually, to be honest, like that's that's kind of important, right? You just take it off for granted. It is a pretty incredible concept that you can have, um, you, you can have basically a tree, and out of the tree, you make. Uh, you, you contain stories. It's a bizarre notion. Like, let's be honest here. It's a bizarre notion that you can just write stories and contain them for for ages in a pack of of, of leaves. Now that's it's bizarre. Insane. Like, it's yeah. insane. Let's get to our final segment. What do we recommend? Not necessarily from what we've been reading lately, but our general recommendation from our old favorites. Mine has to be one I've already yeah. talked about, so I'm not going to go into detail. But my recommendation has to be the original Three Musketeers by mm. by Dumas. It is one of the best books I've ever read. It makes 600 pages feel like 200. You just fly through it in three days. It's just incredibly addictive. It's a real page turner. It's a classic in the swashbuckling genre. It's mm. ultra romantic. It's just guys going around. You bump into me in the street, I will fight you to the death. <laughs> and and that, then, that's very yeah, that's very Don Quixoteian. Isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, that's similar. Very yeah, it is. That's what he does. But what I love is the honor, the chivalry. Yeah. Because when you're at, about to die, they say, "Do you yield?" Yes, and then they pick them up and they are best friends. And they say, "Look, sir, you dropped your money. I'm not here to rob you, just kill you. You know, take your money. On you go. Have a good day." Or if right. someone says, "Well, I can't fight you. I'm injured," they say, "Well, come back when you're healthy. Like I wouldn't want to fight someone who's injured. It's got to be a fair fight. There's a yeah, lot yeah. of honor and chivalry, you know." Yeah. That's so. That's so Quixote, and honestly, like it, it, if you read this, I think I'll read um, this soon afterwards because Quixote does that. He just there's a sense of honor and pride, and that's very kind of sweet, you know. But especially nowadays in such a valueless society, you kind of appreciate that. You know, no one does yeah. that. Now. There's no gentleman anymore, you know. In so, a society that only values money, it was shocking to me that these four friends would just, you know, they never really had much money, and when they got some, they divided yeah. it between them. They never. Yeah. It wasn't all about me, and it was really nice to see that. Yeah, it's awesome, dude. Uh, well, I've got to recommend something. I, uh, well, I, I don't think I don't think you're going to read this, Dean. I've told you about this before, but I think it should be mentioned here because graphic novels and novels, for my, for me, are still uh, stories. Anything is a story, basically, 
And I really recommend for you, if you ever want to, if you ever want to go to the graphic novel section, go and get something called Dylan Dog, which sounds ridiculous actually. The name and it's not. It's is named after Dylan Thomas, by the way, not Bob Dylan. And it's basically a, a series of comics that started in the 80s, an Italian series of comics. And it's very hard to get in translation, but if you can, or, or if you know Italian, then please read it. Because they're essentially supernatural horror comics, but there's so much more than that. They're so, sometimes so incredibly cynical and also at the same time incredibly philosophical. It will blow your mind, actually, the stories and the artwork in it. And I just recommend it. It's... it's it's as sublime. It's like it's as sublime '80s as you can get, but not the cheesy '80s, which I also do like. This is just like the proper get the horror movie atmosphere and turn it into a proper philosophical treatise. And that's actually just a comic that they sold for very cheap, by the way. It wasn't like anything. It wasn't like an art kind of a thing. Mm. But they just get to read any of those comics, and you just have an amazing story that keeps with you with some philosophical themes. Always, always death related, but also love and life and consumerism and hate. And so this is an intelligent philosophical comic book. So something similar to the the Spider Man's, right? A, a very similar to Spider Man, Dean. I can hear a note of cynicism in your voice, Dean. I've tried to <laughs> I've tried to say this before. It is. Do not listen to Dean. This is worth it. Get it, Dylan Dog. Uh, it's also readable online, and um, yeah. And if you can in the original Italian, it, it's just great. It's oh. the bee's knees. Do not listen to my compatriot uh, Dean and his cynical view of that eighth arts or ninth arts called comic. Um, I'm just I'm just a big fan of Batman versus Superman. You know me. That's I, all I, I know that's your about. favorite. That's, I know that's your favorite film. Yeah, you go you go on about it every week. <laughs> so there you go. Garbage. So get it, guys. Um, <laughs> what a garbage movie. Because I don't know I don't know how they're versing each other. I don't know if they're fighting if they're playing chess. I, I, I ha- don't know. I, I bet they don't even verse each other. I bet they team up. But look, there's yeah. one other thing I wanted to do, PJ, before we go. I wanted to yeah. give you a recommendation, not for a book, but oh. for a podcast. I think you would like it. Uh, you can check this out on YouTube, and all the listeners can as well. It's a new show called uh, Priests Who Listen to Jazz, and you can actually what? hear these three priests, you know, just having a chat, having a bit of crack, and right. playing their favorite jazz music. And I think Jesus. it's right up your alley. Okay, well, look, i got to check it out. It's priests Who Listen to Jazz, eh? Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll check it out. And is it is it is it is the jazz good, or is it kind of like a bit kind of conservative kind of jazz? You know. No, the but, jazz is good. The jazz is good. Right, I right, had right. some Jeez. some Terry Como in there, which was good. But there's a oh. good range of stuff. There's some uh, some Kieran Burke in there sometimes. You might have oh, heard him. Oh, he's he's a classic, Kieran Burke. You should listen out to him, guys. Yeah. All right, I'll check it out. Thanks for the recommendation, Dean. Cool. So awesome. let's take us out. I think we've gone a little bit over time. Let's After. end. How do you feel about playing naked woman on a lake to close the well, show? Well, I like the title, I have to, I have to admit, and uh, I think we should play it. Now, do you want to give us a quick 10-second history on this one? This was I... a song you made based on a poem you made based on a painting I made, right? Very complex, right? Yeah, so basically, for all you listeners, me, uh, Dean and I, we've collaborated a lot throughout the years. And one thing we're also going to publish in the near future, hopefully, uh, rather, rather than the far future, is that we're going to publish an art book with our paintings, sorry, with his paintings and my poems. And it started off. It started off with me doing a poem about a palm tree, and then you painting it, and then we just interchangeably, whoever's inspired, someone writes a poem, I write a poem, and then you do the painting, or vice versa, you do the painting, I do the poem. And in this case, you made a great painting, very sort of almost like Oriental. I feel like of a woman basically uh, on a lake, it's like, or, or in a lake. But it's more like on a lake, and there's like a and then there's a deer, there's something very Japanese almost about it, kind of, and um, or Buddhist. And I just was inspired to write this short poem, and which then turned into a song. So this is this is uh, our song, and it comes from our future art book. So, to give you a bit of insight. Guys, check us out online, email us your recommendations, tell your friends about the show, and most importantly, come on back next month. For another episode of Books Boys.
lake, naked, tanning, nothing fake. Gently your hair at your face, except your eyes, which show what I dreamt of you on a lake. Naked, tanning, nothing fake. Gently your hair at your face, except your eyes showed, which showed faith. I dreamt of you on a lake, naked, tanning, nothing fake. Gently your hair at your face, except your eyes show with your faith. <laughs> Dream that we both embrace. I dreamt of you on a lake, naked, turning nothing fake. Gently your hair with your face, except your eyes. We show faith. Dream that we both embrace. I dreamt of you on a lake, naked, tanning, nothing fake. Gently your hair hid your face, except your eyes were showed. I dreamt of you on a lake, naked, tanning, nothing fake. Gently your hair at your face, except your eyes, which showed faith. Books Boys was presented by The Dean and PJ Burke in association with Thaddeus Penguin Productions. Ah. This episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Hungry Hungry Hypocrites. If you would like to get in touch, you can email us at booksboys at hotmail.com or visit us at booksboys.blogspot.com. The intro uses Driving in the 70s from the Of Soundtracks and Garage Fans EP by Trapdoor. And the outro uses Dog's Light by Bravo Max from the album of the same name. All music used is either pod safe or used with permission. Thank you kindly for listening to us. Please tell your friends and come back next time for another episode of Books Boys. Read some books!
BJ, I'm not sure about this. I think we messed up. I think we should have done the other option. We should have explained to them how the, about the creation of the printing press. I think it would have been much more entertaining than just talking about our, the books we've read. I don't know. I don't know.